Did you? So yeah, I just I just happened to catch this uh, magazine, and uh, she's listed as one of the uh, most powerful women. And there's this uh, Fortune magazine has the 50 most powerful women. And I uh, looked at her article and learned that she was an econ major. So that's really the main reason I brought it here. So there's lots of econ majors. Uh, great major for women to rise to power. I'd love to get the top 50 and see what their majors were of all 50. But I just thought I'd point that out. Uh, that was econ major. So she, lo she owes all of her success to economics. Uh, she's quoted in the article saying that. I'm totally lying, by the way, totally lying. She did not say anything even close to that. I'm just reading between the lines. Yes. So one of the questions says when there is no or part of our own effect, you know, interest rate rises with the public or it's a little bit like interest rate does what, it does what does what, yeah. Okay. So do they just mean like the crowding out effect if there's no or part of borrow effect? And it's the crowding out it's effect? It's a full crowding out effect, yes. Okay. Yes. Right. Yep. So the, the, the question was, uh, there's apparently a test question on Ricardo Barrow effect and as it relates to crowding out. Those are kind of two separate concepts. So the Ricardo Barrow effect makes the crowding out effect smaller. So the reason that they phrased it that way is assume there's no Ricardo Barrow effect, which means you get the full crowding out effect. Okay. All right. Um, let's see. Oh, another article I wanted to bring to your attention. This was in the Wall Street Journal. Um, when was this? Just this week, within the last week. And um, I'll put a couple of this on, on paper here. So you guys maybe have heard that the minimum wage is, is uh, kind of been an issue here lately, a policy issue. Who knows what the minimum wage is currently? 725. 725. So we got 725, and then we've got uh, a potential proposal to raise it to 1010. So, and why are we raising it? Why would, what would be the reason to, what's the uh, intentions of raising it? Okay, cost of living, what else? <coughs> Rent is too big. Rent is high, <laughs> cost of living. Encourage economic growth. So get people more money that need it, right? The poor, help the poor out, that type of thing. All right, so uh, what did we learn in the labor market that if the minimum wage goes up, what might that cause in another statistic or variable to change? More people will work, be willing to work, Less people have jobs. There's a potentially, as wages go up, employers hire less people. So it might cause additional unemployment. The Congressional Budget Office, which is a bipartisan think tank of economists, uh, where, where's my article go? Oh, here it is. Good old CBO. Estimated <laughs> that by 2016, there would be 500,000 jobs eliminated because of the increase in minimum wage. So that would be the job loss part. So as we, um, first of all, if, if, the, if there's a lot of jobs at the 725, then there already is some employment, unemployment due to that potentially. Um, and I think this article said there was 3.1 million workers at 725. Or below. So there's kind of some interesting statistics in here. As this goes up to 1010, then the effect we're talking about is that employers will reduce the labor demanded, so the quantity demanded will fall, and they're coming up with 500,000 jobs, if we're measuring it in terms of jobs moving this direction. Now, on the flip side, they estimated that 900,000 Americans uh, will be lifted out of poverty. 
from the total of 45 million that are projected to be living in poverty. So <clears throat> the types of things that we're learning in economics is to think about what those numbers mean. So here's my notebook paper scratches. It should be perfectly legible for you. All right, just want to throw a couple of these out here for fun. So I just, again, this is me on the back of a notebook paper, right? So I'm just kind of sketching things out. But 500,000 people lose their job at 7.25 an hour, right? So the cost there of 3.6 million. 900,000 people that are in poverty now have an increase of their wage of $2.85. The distance from 725 up to 1010 is a 285 bump in pay, which is then uh, helping them be lifted out of poverty. So the benefit of that, 2.5 million. Cost to these folks who lost their jobs, benefit to the folks, the impoverished folks, I gotta kind of lay that out, of two points of 2.5. So if our objective is to help people in poverty, this doesn't look that great, right? Now, there's actually 3.1 million people I mentioned that were at this 725. So not all of those people are living in poverty. Some of you might be earning 725, right? There's high school kids earning 725. There's other people that are members of a family that aren't living in poverty that are making 725. So there are 3.1 million people that would be benefiting the, from the 285 bump, giving us an $8.8 .8 million benefit. Okay, so there's, at least now we've got the benefits outweighing the cost of the people losing the job. In theory, again, this is a little bit um, hand wavy looking at the per hour amounts. Um, but something that a lot of people don't think about then is one way to look at this is that the benefit going to these people of 8.8 .8 million was partially paid for by the people who lost their jobs. That was kind of the transfer on the island. If we think about the transfer of welfare that went on, we've got the 500,000 people losing, and we've got the 900,000 or the 3.1 gaining. So they lose, they pay. So in a sense, that policy caused a transfer of wealth from one group to the other. The thing that I don't like is that the two groups we're swapping with. We've got people who were working for 725 that are helping to pay for the people that were also making 725. That doesn't seem like the best policy to me, that we take from the poor to give to the poor. That's kind of what's going on slightly here with the 28%, 3.6 divided by 8.8, as high as 28% roughly is a transfer from the poor to the poor, potentially. Again, we don't know that the person working at McDonald's isn't a high schooler whose parents are super rich and he's making 7.5. That's all part, that's kind of buried in those numbers as well. Now, where does the rest of it get paid? This is the, maybe a little bit deeper, I don't think the article <coughs> even touched on this, but where does the other part of this get 8.8 .8 get paid. So these guys pay 3.6 million towards it, but there's still 72% of that being paid by somebody. Remember that with price controls, like a minimum wage or price ceilings or price floors, this is a price floor. With price controls, is the government collecting any money? No. They're not collecting any money. From this specific policy of minimum wage, they're not collecting money off of the policy. So what's gonna happen to the price of a burger at McDonald's? Goes up. So in general, the products that have a large fraction of labor that uses minimum wage labor, those prices of those particular products will tend to go <coughs> up. Okay, so think, kind of run with me here a little bit. Now, if you're a poor person and you're making $20,000 a year, how does your fraction of purchases of products that have a large fraction of minimum, minimum wage pay 
compared to the person making $100,000 a year. The fraction of your income of money spent on those types of goods. Probably higher. Really. Probably higher as a fraction of your income. Maybe the rich person spends 10000 at McDonald's and other related minimum wage type places. I'm just kind of picking on Mickey D's. And the poor person spends 10000 on minimum wage related products, right? So now the poor person's making 20000 and spending 10000 at those types of places or that have minimum wage type of, of jobs. And the rich person spending that at those types of places with minimum wage jobs. Those prices of burgers go up by something, 10%. I've seen some estimates of 20% uh, on the price of a hamburger with, uh, with this type of increase. So, and that's specific to that hamburger. Again, it depends on how much of a fraction the minimum wage worker makes up of the, of the production process. So who's then paying the lion's share of this part of the pie? The poor or the rich? The poor, again. So the poor are paying this part, and I think the poor are paying a larger fraction of that part as well. That's not the best policy in my opinion. I'd rather transfer money from the rich to the poor, not the poor to the poor. But you don't hear that talked about in the media, right? You don't hear that part of the argument very often brought up. And it's definitely not a slam dunk, by the way, on the minimum wage, but it is being debated by, by um, politicians and, and other folks currently. All right, questions or comments? Um, I read an article recently uh, from Jack in the Box. They did a, like, they, did, they crunched the numbers for their own company. Yeah. And they said if they only use their, like they raise the cost of their products in just their California uh, locations, which is where the majority of their stores are at, yeah. that they'd only have to raise their prices one point Okay. And if they did it across the nation for all of their stores, they only have to raise about 1.1% in order to pay for the difference. Was that a, uh, because of a minimum wage increase yes. in California only or something? Yeah. 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 They so they could absorb it in the other stores is what they were saying. Yeah. They could do, if they did the increase for 2016, right. the minimum wage to 1010, they would have to raise, if they only did their California, 1.4% more for 1.1% if they did Yeah, if you find that article, I'd like to look at it. But yeah, so the, there is some sort of price effect that's going to go out. And then as you start thinking about how you spend your money, if there's a difference between the fraction of spending that goes on between rich and poor, then it starts to potentially support that we're really transferring poor to poor more than... That. And so the question is, is there another policy that would do it? And re those of you who had me in micro, we kind of walked through a, a different example. Um, and so I would, I would prefer to just make up the difference between uh, what the market's paying and that. In this particular example, I think it would be better if, if, if the status quo was 725, a better solution would be to make up the difference up to 1010. Keep it at 725, but then if we feel like we need to help um, some other uh, folks out, find a different way. If we raise taxes, or inflate things away, we can raise, it'll, uh, the prices will be spread, spread more evenly across everyone rather than concentrated industries that have a large fraction of minimum wage labor. Because the Silicon Valley is untouched by this, right? I mean, that sort of minimum wage increase, that doesn't affect them other than the Silicon Valley engineers when they go to McDonald's and they see that they find that the price is a little bit higher at the cash register. That's their share of the policy burden. Well, um, I think one of the issues with it is that I think the minimum wage was changed to 725 in like 2008. Mm -hmm. Well, after six years, the value of the real value of that wage has gone down due to inflation. Right. So, what was 725 was much greater then than it was is now. Right. I mean, and so. In my opinion, that's moving the right direction. So I, I think it should be eliminated. I'm probably, I might have darts thrown at me in, in, in the wrong type of crowd, but I want it eliminated and replaced with something that leaves the poor in just as good, if not a better position. Because under my thinking, 
let's put more people to work at that wage. Let's put more people to work at 1010. I'm willing to put dollars in a different way. I'm just saying this is a lousy way to do it. This is a lousy way to, to get our intentions accomplished, in my opinion. So then going to all sales tax, the proportionate version Yeah, yeah. So imagine we have a, and, and uh, somebody, one of my students, I can't remember if it's one of you guys or somebody else, told me that um, somebody is proposing a federal sales tax on internet sales. Was that you, Brandon? Okay. I had not heard that one yet. So imagine that we take this, uh, what did I estimate it to be? $8.8 .8 million and we collect the, enough money to pay for that spread to everybody who's making $7.25. We make up the difference with the sales tax. Then all prices, not just the McDonald's hamburger, but the Silicon Valley, all the, all prices would tend to pay for that, and it'd actually be consumption of those goods. I'd be more of a proponent of heading something that direction. Well, and then Kansas is proposing that we do an all sales tax rather than Kansas yes. Taxes. Yep, that is Kansas. There's a there's a group of people, and it's there's some support at the higher levels to, to investigate a consumption tax in Kansas and eliminate income tax that altogether. Would place the burden on those in lower income levels, though. Well. We're going to talk more about that issue, so I don't want to spend too much time today, but um, all the loopholes and all the stuff that are there, what's claimed is that if, if we, we could keep the tax close to what it is right now at the cash register, 9% or roughly what it is, but we're eliminating all the income tax loopholes that primarily go to benefit the non-poor anyway, people with money. And we eliminate all the loopholes, and we just collect all sales tax through the 9% sales tax like we do already. That's the gist of it. And there's some details that I'm not even that familiar with. So no, it wouldn't really negatively affect um, the poor if the consumption tax ends up staying at about 9%. Well, using your example, you know, if the income levels are spending $10,000 on, you know, uh -huh. the same But they're not, compared to the status quo, there's, there's not any difference. So you always kind of got to go back to, the, to what's going on currently. Their life is going to continue on. Their paycheck's going to work the same. Actually, their paycheck's going to work even better because there's no income tax. Although if they're poor, they might not be paying any income tax anyway. But they get the same amount in. They run to the store that's 9% just like it was before. So there's no change to that. All right, good question. So. Just thought I'd bring up my pencil sketches sometimes. Yeah, I like doing that once in a while. So um, we are done with chapter seven. And I guess this is good. I've got the labor market here. I wanted to kind of recap our longer run plan for the class, which is to build four markets and try to explain the world, uh, or at least shed a little more light on what goes on in the world. And so we did the labor market, chapter six. <coughs> chapter seven, we just left demand for loanable funds, supply of loanable funds. We talked about investment and the importance of tractors versus Twinkies. And we've got the real rate of interest Borrowers and lenders coming together. We looked at how um, a government deficit affects what's going on in the private sector. Um, so we covered kind of those topics in the loanable funds market. Today we start the money market. So down here, we're going to be looking at money. And money's a little bit different than loans and loanable funds. This is a little more longer term. This is usually very short term. So we can think about the currency that we hold in our wallet, the payments that we make, the checks that we do, all of that sort of um, fun stuff. So we're going to be measuring the quantity of money. 
and I'm just going to do a real quickie here. We're going to dive into details, but and here we're going to measure uh, the interest rate. So we got money, currency, all kinds of stuff like that, and then we're going to establish uh, the the money market, and the supply of money is going to end up looking perfectly vertical because it's controlled by the Federal Reserve or the central bank. And so we're thinking that, okay, there's only a certain amount of money today. And it looks like that. That's how much money is floating around on our, on our island. And then the demand for money comes from households and businesses, people that want to hold their wealth in the form of money. All right, and then ultimately here, we're gonna be measuring uh, real GDP which we also now equate with the letter Y for income. So the nation's income and the nation's spending, they're kind of one and the same. The quantity of goods, it's real GDP. And then the <laughs> prices of those goods is the price level, like the CPI, the Consumer Price Index. So what's happening to the average level of prices? So this is going to be called the goods market. And I'm not even going to get into the details yet there, but that'll be chapter 10. All right, so money it is. Money, money, money. What is, what are, sorry, what are different ways to pay for goods. Go. Hit me with some ideas here. What are different ways to pay for goods? Bartering. Bartering. What does that mean? Trading thing. Okay, so you just trade good for good, right? Barter. Other ways, Gabe. Okay, that'd probably fall into the, the barter. It could be service for good or good for good. How about some easy things like pull some cash out of your, out of your wallet or purse, right? Yes. So how about currency? Let me get your juices flowing here. So currency would be one way to do it. Uh, no, it's not. That is, that, so I'm looking for different ways you guys pay for goods. Credit. Credit, good, we got the credit card. Not good, but we got the credit card. What else? Gift. Gift. Card? Okay, because I want you paying for things, so I wasn't thinking of the gift as far as giving it or getting it. So gift card. That works. What else? How else do you guys go to the store and buy stuff? Talk to me. Debit card. Debit card. A check. A check. Now our juices are flowing here. So <laughs> now we're getting creative. A check. Almost becoming obsolete, but they're still around. We can do bank payments, and the bank actually writes them for us now. But those good old checks are out there. Traveler's check. There's an old one that is almost obsolete, but a traveler's check. Yeah, some of you might not know what that is. Uh, when, when you used to travel, instead of carrying currency, you could carry these traveler's checks, and you had a little more protection if they got lost then you could get them back, and companies would take those from you as if it was cash. Oh, interesting. Yeah, I, I haven't even seen one for a long time. I, don't even, I assume they're still out there, but I think if you went to go some pay for something at Walmart, well, Walmart probably would take anything, but uh, if you go to the local pizza time here, they'd probably look at you like, what and, country uh, is this from? Oh, Lewis? What about like the food stamps? Food stamps, yeah. So food stamps. Okay, which is usually on a card now, too. <laughs> Coupons. So we might have a buy one, get one free, or we might have a, some sort of deal, $10 off. What else? Uh, so a prize. Um, probably still have to go to the store if you're claiming your prize, or what, what would you have? Some sort of thing. Similar to a gift card. 
So I'm thinking of going to the store, whipping out something so that you can take away the stuff that you want. Anything else? I think there's a couple more we could squeeze on here. We're getting close to the end. We got currency. What kind of goes along with currency? Something is $1.48, you might use coins. Yeah, so currency, Bills. some coins if we're getting real specific. Okay. Anything else? That's probably a pretty good list. We can probably stop there. What's that? Reward points. Yeah, we could throw that one on there. Yeah. Reward points, which might be, yeah, it usually comes from other stuff. Kind of similar to a kind of a version of a coupon. Oh, I know one that you techie people should know. That's not on here. Bitcoin. Oh Bitcoins. I even said Stop. coins. No. Now, bitcoins, uh, <laughs> and by the way, I do not advise you using bitcoins. Maybe after we go through this particular oh, chapter, you'll understand why a little bit more. But um, just today, I heard on the news, Japan, some huge institution of some sort, some business uh, filed bankruptcy because they are losing their tail somehow. I didn't quite catch all the details. Really, it's something related to bitcoins. Oh, the guy. Oh, the originator of it? Yeah. No, I wouldn't doubt it. It was, um, yeah. We'll, we'll learn a lot here in this chapter. This is kind of fun. So, um, which one of these are money? Currency? It's a pure inflated market. Coins. Debit. It's not worth investing in because it's the chance. Credit? Yeah. Gift card? Have no idea. Yeah. Food stamps? Yeah. What does it take to be called money? I mean, what are we looking for to distinguish money from all these various types of payments? First of all, we all agree that you can use these to get stuff, right? These are all different ways to pay for goods, but they're not all money. So we've got something kind of special that we're going to have for money. I circled currency because currency is money by the definition provided by our government, I guess. But what separates currency from the food stamps or the gift card? You can only spend them at a certain place, right? So the special thing, the special property that money has to it is that it's generally accepted as a means of payment, right? It's generally accepted as a means of payment. And even, you guys have seen at some of the gas stations, you know, they might not take cash if they're in a rough neighborhood because they don't want to uh, run the risk of, of somebody breaking in and stealing. But for the most part, currency, cash, good old cash is, is accepted everywhere. So money, money is anything generally accepted as a means of payment. Anything generally accepted as a means of payment. So the check, well a credit card is generally accepted, isn't it? I mean, you, can't you use that just about anywhere? Okay, yeah, it, it's kind of along those lines. With a credit card, what have you really done when you've swiped it? You've borrowed. You've taken an instant loan from the owner of that card, whether it's a bank or something else. So you've kind of taken an instant loan when you've swiped. When you do the debit card, you're using your own money. It's coming right out of your account. So that's a little bit different. The bank who issued your credit card used their money to buy your thing. So there was an element of money involved, but it wasn't you at the point of purchase. So credit cards are not in the money category. Now, we talked about barter and maybe good for good or service for good. Um, what have we heard about 
in prisons, hopefully not from direct experience, but from um, uh, maybe some TV shows. What is money in the prison? What'd you say, Liz? Cigarettes. Cigarettes. You got the smokes, right? So cigarettes, soap, you've heard of money? Okay. So what makes the cigarettes money? The fact that people want them and they'll trade them and they'll use them and they'll hold them. So there's some properties there that make cigarettes money. Now, are all US dollars everywhere money? I better pull out my prop here. Is this money everywhere? If you go to Japan, if you go to Japan to a place like Ottawa Main Street, which is probably going to look a little different, but you go to some store in Japan and you pull this out, are you going to get the goods that you want? Probably no. It depends. It could. But is it generally accepted all over that nation? Are dollars generally accepted as a means of payment? No. So in Japan, the US dollar is not money. In the United States, the US dollar is money. In Ecuador, the US dollar is money because they have kind of adopted it as one of their currencies. So in other places, dollar for dollar or 10 to one, uh, Mexico, a lot of places in Mexico will accept dollars too. They'll take pesos or dollars. So. Um, that's what determines what money is, is that it's generally accepted as a means of payment. So it kind of broadens our, our thoughts on what that is. Um, so there are three properties that kind of make money. Um, purposes of money. I'm all in. <laughs> so I might as well tell you this little notation thing that I tend to do. So money, I usually put two slashes. And if I think about the dollar, I usually put one slash. I know that's kind of a weird little thing, but I just kind of think like dollar, this is like a D. And this is like a little M with the two slashes. So that might be my shorthand. I'll verbalize usually money or dollar. But that's, uh, that'll be a little convention you can take note of. So three purposes of money. One, we just said, a medium of exchange. Money provides a medium of exchange generally accepted. And I'll just put dot, dot, dot since we just kind of put that up here. That's our one purpose of money. The purpose is to provide a unit of account. A unit of account. So quoting values Quoting values in a common unit makes it easier to compare relative um, worth. Yeah, exactly. So well, this couch is worth three yaks, but this one is worth three horses. Three horses, three yaks. OK, I get it, but what's, which couch is better? I don't know. What does a horse sell for? What does a yak sell for? So having it all in terms of dollars allows us for almost an instantaneous valuation because a couch that runs $1,000 versus a couch that runs $3,000, what can you tell me about? the value of those two couches. Which one's nicer? The $1,000 couch or the $3,000 couch? I don't know, I have to sit on them. You'd have to sit on and feel the cushion, but 
your gut feeling would say that in general in a market system, people can't just jack their prices up to 3,000 when it's only worth 1,000. Why? What do, what's our belief in capitalism that that doesn't happen very often? Although you can get screwed, buyer beware, caveat emptor. We just did that in personal finance today, right? You need to check things out. But for the most part, what keeps us from being able to jack prices up like that? Competition, competition. good. So competition, if prices are efficient, there's a $3,000 couch and a $1,000 couch, the $3,000 couch probably has a little thicker leather, nicer cushions, blah, 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 right? So we kind of have that going on having dollars provide a unit of account to compare uh, relative worth. Okay, so let's put that little example down, I guess you can. So price of a couch, price of a couch equals 1,000 versus, this is couch one, price of couch two equals 3,000. Couch three is very likely to be nicer. So quoting values in a common unit makes it easy to go couch shopping. What was the question? Oh, what did couch? P2 and then couch three. So oh, sorry. Couch two. Yeah, I need a couch two there. Thank you. You guys always feel free to ask me what the heck I put up. That is not the first nor the last time that that's happened. Okay. Number three, a store of value. A store of value. It is a convenient way to store your wealth. So, what's wealth? We talked about wealth a few different times. We've got the little <laughs> bucket of wealth. What is wealth? difference between assets and liabilities, what we own minus what we owe, right? So assets versus liabilities, you take the accounting approach or just think about what we own versus what we owe. If there's money in your wallet, that's your money. That's to the positive side on your wealth. So it's a convenient way to store wealth, but is it a good way to store your wealth? Are there other things that you could be storing your wealth with? A house, probably a good or better place to be than money long term. What else? Savings accounts, investment accounts, brokerage accounts, cars, paintings. There's lots of different ways to own stuff that might be a better place to store your wealth. Because what happens, if you put it in the right place, what happens to the value of those assets over time? They go up. What does a dollar buy you 20 years from now if you pull this out of your mattress? Less, it buys you a dollar worth of stuff though, that's a good, good thing. But the amount of stuff that you buy with that dollar could be dramatically less, right? Because it's just a piece of paper. There's no uh, appreciation, unless there's deflation. But that's kind of a weirdo scenario that we don't need to go. If, if prices actually go down and you held on to your dollars, then you could be in a better place. That's not gonna happen with the current Federal Reserve, so you don't have to worry about it. So, <clears throat> convenient way to store wealth. It sucks though, it sucks though as an investment. So what we really do is we use it for transactions, right? So a primary purpose, purpose, is for what economists call transactions demand. Transactions demand. So 
So how much money do you carry in your wallet? Well, it's coming on the weekend. I need to carry 20. Well, you. 100. 150. Whatever your number is, you've got some sort of equilibrium in your gut that makes you kind of think, I got the weekend coming up. I need to hold a certain amount of cash to kind of carry out my plans for the weekend, right? That's what we call transactions demand. The amount of money that you're holding for that purpose of consumption that's in the near term. All right. Um, let's see. Let's look at some of the measures of money. So the government has come up with some definitions of money. So measures of money. The first definition, some clever government official, probably an economist, came up with M1. The first measure of money, M1. All right. <clears throat> yes, it is a brilliant, brilliant Navy scheme. So we've got in M1, we've got currency plus checking account deposits. Checking account deposits. So one thing to be aware of is that this is currency held by the public, not in bank vaults, not bank vaults. We're trying to think of money, how much money is actually floating around out there for people to use to do trades, right? To do transactions. In other words, between that and checking, it's essentially what we're ready to spend like that. You got it, right? So it's money that's really going to be <coughs> likely to be spent fairly quickly. So checking account deposits, it's sitting in a checking account, somebody's planning on spending that. It's not in their savings account, it's in their checking account. All right, so that brings us to our, our next measure of money, M2. Brilliant. Yes, That's another brilliant. brilliant one. Now, the first one is the most important thing to take into account for M2. It is M1. All right. And then we're going to add some stuff on. So M2 is M1 plus we're going to bring those savings accounts into the picture. So savings accounts. Plus small time deposits. Small time deposits. And small is less than a hundred grand. Oh yeah, just a little baby one. <clears throat> Let me write them out and then we'll explain. Last one is money market accounts. Money market accounts. So we've added on these three elements. So have you guys heard of CDs at banks? Yeah, certificates of depression is what Dave Ramsey called them. So CDs are deposits that you make with the bank and you promise to let them have your money for a fixed period of time. Usually it's three months or six months or a year. It can go up to five years for these certificates of deposit is what they call the CD rates. And so those time deposits are still, you know, able to be used in a fairly short order, but they're kind of tied up. And that's the one that has uh, the little disclaimer at the end, substantial penalty for early withdrawal. So if you pull your money out before the six months is up, then the bank charges you a, a bit of a fee for not letting them hold on to your money longer. So those are time deposits. These are the CDs. What 
call them certificates of depression because again, uh, in the financial world for long-term wealth building, you don't wanna hold on to these things, they're lousy. They're paying like 2% or 3% currently. Um, they're starting to rise a little bit, but you could be putting it into something else. So it's a fairly uh, small interest rate the trade-off is, is that it's basically risk-free. There's no risk to it. I mean, you're, you're going to get your 2% or 3%, whatever they promised. You're, you're guaranteed it. Um, if it's under 100000 then you've got some of that FDIC insurance and stuff like that backing it even if the bank goes under. Okay, money market counts. These, are, these have evolved uh, quite a bit over the last 20 to 30 years. They just started to come around uh, then and um, get more popular. With these accounts, your money is, again, usually a little tied up. It's usually a bigger minimum balance, so you have to have like at least 10 grand, let's say. Again, it depends on the bank and the institution, but you're kind of parking your money there, and they give you a little bit better interest rate. Again, it's not a great place long-term for, for you to have your money. And then savings accounts, we're aware of, of the awesome interest rates that those pay. <laughs> what are you guys getting on your savings account? Do you know? What's that? 0.01. Woo! That's not uncommon. 0.01. 0.01%. So if you put $100 into the account and hold it for one solid year, you get a what does that transform itself into if you have 0.01? One, you get a penny. One shiny little penny. What a great investment. All right, yes. so the purpose of this is um, not really to be an investment at all. It's there to just park your money. It's saved. You can use it. You're thinking about saving up some money to go buy that couch rather than going into debt and using a credit card or using the 90 days same as cash deal. Maybe, here's a concept, put $200 into a savings account for the next six months and pay cash for it when you get it, right? So it's, it's a safe place. It, it has a purpose. It's just not for long-term investments. It's just there for this reason. All right, so there's, there's some other measures of money that uh, we're not even gonna list um, that start to add more things onto this. As you look at M1 versus M2, which one is more liquid? Which one's more liquid, M1? What is liquidity? It's going to be availability to how quick you can get access to it or spend it or do what you want. Okay, to do something with your money. So there's a couple different definitions, but the idea of something being fairly liquid, if you have a liquid asset, you can probably turn it into cash pretty quickly, right? There's a lot of buyers for it. You can just, if you're owning stock on, in the stock market, you can find a buyer today. Just call up your broker and say, I want to sell my shares. What's the market price? Boom, gone, it's liquid, right? So you can convert your money into cash. Probably within three days, there might be a little bit of a delay of going through the accounts, but you'll have your money eventually pretty quickly. So it's relatively liquid. But the most liquid thing is cash itself. Since it's general, whoops, I had that generally accepted thing. Since it's generally accepted, that makes it very easy to get the things you want, right? So it's already, so sometimes people refer to this as the most liquid asset, or you think of assets in their ability to be converted into it. And so as we look at these two levels, we start to decrease the liquidity as we move down. All right, we'll pick up there on uh, Monday. So this is chapter eight stuff. I got my uh, statement from my bank for last week.